Hello and welcome back to the Property and Lending Podcast, Season 2023. As always, joined with Freddie and Mark from Power Loans. How are you, gentlemen? How was your New Year's? I was in bed by 10.15, so it was pretty good for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't far off, so I can take on this mark. Huh? I wasn't far off, perfect mark. Yeah. How about you? Where were you? I was at a uh, French house um, and we were just day. enjoying each other's company to 1am, watching the soccer. Oh, and yeah. um, then I went home and went to sleep. Yeah. Standard. New Year's is getting uh, pretty boring every year that goes by now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we're back and uh, I guess that we're going to be uh, even more consistent this year than last year and we had a lot of uh, listeners and good episodes last year and good guests. So this year we've got some uh, some interesting topics and stuff to to come through and some good guests coming through as well. Um, before we kick off uh, today's episode, we thought we'd ask uh, Mark, um, what what are your general feelings on 2022? Uh, how did you find the year from a uh, personal perspective as well as a property and lending perspective? Yeah, let's stick to property and lending. So, um, <laughs> I think across the Sydney market, we saw a downturn, uh, which was interesting because it doesn't happen too often um, to the degree that it did. I think it was like 10% or something. Okay, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, obviously, markets within markets, like we say, not every single suburb went down. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, interesting time for property. Very interesting time for lending as well with rates moving so quickly and pre-approvals, despite being pre-approved, um, no longer servicing within the pre-approved period um, as the rates were moving so quickly. Um, we also found a few banks coming out and saying, hey, send us your clients um, to do pre-approvals with us because we'll be locking in those assessment rates. So if you're pre-approved for X thousand dollars, then when you come to purchase, you will be able to get X thousand dollars, assuming obviously income doesn't change. Um, so a lot of um, sort of interesting changes, a lot of good cashback offers coming out for refinances at the end of last year when the activity in the refinancing market was um, hit record levels as well. So very interesting time for 2022 and 2023 um, sure won't disappoint. And how did that make you feel personally? <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone felt the pinch with all the rates going up, so... <laughs> I don't think anyone enjoyed, uh, anyone that was on variable at least wouldn't enjoy it. I'm sure everyone that was fixed uh, was uh, was very happy to see uh, what they were paying and what they would be paying if they didn't fix. So kudos for everyone that fixed and for anyone that's variable, get us up and let's um, get you a better deal. Well, speaking of a uh, better deal, uh, by the way, that was a beautiful summation of um, 2022. I can't wait for next week's uh, Mark's interesting tip of the week. Uh, <laughs> very excited. <laughs> Um, but yeah, speaking of, of, you know, refinancing and what people are going to do, obviously interest rates are, have been increasing, um, pretty much all of last year. Uh, looks like they're going to continue to increase inflation rates have again, increased, um, in the last couple of months to 7.3%. So whilst inflation increases, the RBA tells us that interest rates are also going to continue to increase to try and curb the inflation rate. Um, so based on the fact that we're, we're thinking that interest rates are going to continue to rise um, and something that you touched on in your, your feelings on 22 um, and something that people are coming to you guys for, uh, refinancing, we thought we would have a chat about refinancing. And obviously, because as interest rates go up, people pay more for their mortgages and having um, you know, lower borrowing powers than they would have uh, had before. Um, so I guess, is that the best way to combat the rise in interest rates? Is it just to refinance and just keep, you know, speaking to your banks and speaking to your brokers on, on what the best rates are and just continually doing a, you guys call it a health check on your, on your loans. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think this year, especially you know, in the last couple of years during COVID, everyone fixed on their 1.98. Some people fixed at 1.75. And most of our, you know, you see a lot of customers that come through or fixing between two to three years. We had like a few, Customers that went and fixed for the whole five years at 1.98 or 2.08, which was a pretty good move on their behalf at the time um, and now as well. I think the conversations that we're having now with customers 
a little bit more intense, uh, a little bit more upsetting. Um, you're finding customers coming off that beautiful honeymoon rate that we've been discussing for the last cu uh, couple of years. And depending on how big the loan is, it's, it's a large increase um, to their monthly repayment. So it's, it's definitely something you'd be speaking to your broker about, calling him up in regards to finding the best interest rate. As Mark mentioned previously, we've got quite a number of lenders at the moment offering cashback offers, which does help. It covers, you know, the transfer fees in regards to the government transfer fees for the loan, discharge costs, and also leaves you a little bit left, you know, to enjoy yourself with, um, depending on which lender. So Mark, from memory, I think we had lenders offering $6,000 cashback, $5,000 cashback, $4,000 cashbacks, all the way down to $2,000 cashbacks. Obviously, most of our customers try to take advantage of the six and four and five thousand um, dollars. I think we both saw a lot of customers come through just before Christmas time, and if they had a few properties, some customers were getting between eight to fourteen thousand dollars in cash back, and at the same time, getting a much better rate on their home loan. Um, and we're seeing a lot of more proactive customers asking a lot more questions around offset accounts. I've saved a bit of money now that the rate is going a little bit more high. I can actually offset my my home loan to try and save on the interest. Um, so definitely there's a lot of options out there and let's not forget, does anyone remember what the interest rates were before COVID hit? What the average interest rate was? Yeah, over seven, eight percent. And if you so go, that, far, if you go far back enough, they were in the, in the teens. So one, one month prior to COVID, I was still, before the first COVID went down, I was fixing customers on a 3.75% three year fixed. And that was an unbelievable deal. Everyone was going for that sort of rate. But the variable rate at the time was around the 4.02% average. So these were the rates that we were okay with paying at the time. What happened through COVID, I think we've, we've discussed this quite a bit, you know, in to, to 2022 where buffer rate went down, interest rates went down, borrowing capacity went through the roof, and we found a lot more people coming through and able to borrow a lot more than they were able to six months or two months or three months prior to COVID. Um, and I think a number of, a number of us got trapped in the, uh, the RBS and I'm going to int uh, increase the interest rates to at least 2024, nothing to worry about. You can stay on these rates for that time being. And that's what we're, that's the kind of challenges that we're facing now as brokers or all brokers, all lenders are facing where customers are coming through and quite surprised in regards to what their repayments are now going to be increased to. And I guess our job is to try and make that, experience and that rate as low as possible to make the monthly repayments, you know, a little bit more suitable for their needs. Yeah. I mean, in, interesting you talk about cashback because I just refinanced and my cashback went missing, apparently. Uh, Power Loans just bought a new car or something. So um, anyway, moving on. Oh, great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark, I might ask you, um, for people that don't know, simply uh, what, what is a refinance? What does that actually mean? So um, a refinance is when your current mortgage is discharged from your current lender and is kind of like bought out, if you want to think about it that way, with a new lender. So essentially what happens is when you bought the property initially, um, your bank that was providing the funds plus your deposit was uploaded probably on this uh, platform called Texa that solicitors now use and everything's sort of done digitally now. Um, and then the seller sort of met up on the same platform and the funds were exchanged. And now your name went on the title and your bank's name went on the title. Um, when a refinance happens, same thing. Your current bank um, will your current bank will go to Texa um, to give away your loan to the new bank that will also be on Texa. And they're kind of like buying out your loan. Um, there are costs involved in the process and it does differ between states. Um, so roughly New South Wales, again, very rough figures. They do change every, um, the, they change over the financial year. So roughly um, maybe $300 for New, for New South Wales. That's just the title fees. That's regarding to um, the to change the title on the property. Your name still stays on the property if you're refinancing, but your bank's name, current bank will be moved and the new bank goes on. So that's the fee there. Um, in Queensland, it's a few thousand. So it's actually quite a, a bit more expensive. Uh, and so every state kind of differs. And that's kind of the ideal behind cashback offers to entice customers to come to us um, the fees and the cashback are going to cancel out or you'll be left with a bit of a surplus. So there's no reason not to refinance. That's kind of the rationale behind it. Um, yeah. In terms of like the process, um, it's pretty much exactly the same as when you came to, board the, to buy the property initially. In terms of different documentation, 
you don't need to evidence your savings because you're not purchasing a property. So that's one difference. Um, the second one is typically we have to hold six months of um, statements with your current loan. That's just to show the conduct on the loan so that we can make sure that there's no missed repayments or anything because that could impact the result of the refinance. So that's really the only two changes besides that same sort of stuff, pay slips or if you're self-employed, tax returns uh, with IDs and that sort of thing. So Yeah, so if, if someone... Go ahead. So I think it's important to highlight as well. Um, when we're looking to refinance or a customer is coming to us to look to refinance or try and get a better rate, we're always going to try and negotiate with their current lender because it, it's a lot more less expensive for them. They're not going to have to do pay the transfer costs, the discharge costs, um, et cetera. So we always try to with our existing customers or new customers to come through. We're looking to refinance just to make the make it more of a smoother kind of process because at the moment, it's a little bit more harder for our customers. Um, the you know, living expenses are going up. Like you said, inflation is going up. Groceries are going up. Petrol is going up. Everything is going up. So we're always going to do the right thing by our customers in regards to try and negotiate with their current lender. Um, and for example, like let's say customers are coming through now, they're looking to refinance. They've come off their two-year fixed rate. We, we all know that it's a 30-year loan term for each home loan. So if they're at 28 years, we'd love to, you know, if it's their owner-occupier property and they're looking to pay it down, it's their, in their best interest to stick to the 28 years to continually pay that home loan down so they're not constantly renewing it. But in a lot of scenarios or, you know, some scenarios, we, it's more sometimes beneficial for the customer where we lower that loan repayment. Obviously, extending it back to 30 years lowers that loan repayment for them. Um, but it's important to highlight that we try to negotiate with the current lender to just try and save our customers a little bit more stress, a little bit more time, because it's still, like Mark said, a process in regards to like purchasing a home. You still have to supply documents. Um, you also have to supply council rates, statements. Um, but that's the most important thing is actually looking after the customer, making sure we negotiate with the current lender. If the current lender are not willing to come to the table in regards to what rates other lenders are actually out there handing out or at least giving the customer cash back, that's when we move on. Yeah, so so in, in some circumstances, the, the loan term will reset again to 30 years. Um, so it's going to obviously add a longer period, but might reduce their, their repayment. So obviously... A conversation that the broker and and when we're talking about you know millions or you know close to a million dollars plus in in loans those you know one percent or so we're talking thousands of dollars over the year so definitely worth a conversation with the broker is there are there rules to refinancing like how soon you can refinance or if you're on a fixed loan can you refinance or um are, are there rules to refinancing or can you just do it at any time it honestly depends on what product you're on as well. So you mentioned fixed interest rate. For example, if you're, well, obviously no one on a 1.75 or 1.98% is not going to come to us to refinance. Um, if you're on a variable, there really isn't no rule in regards to when you can refinance. It's just that it comes down to if it's going to be beneficial for the customer. So if you're going to, let's say you refinance to one lender and after six months you want to change again, is there going to be a financial benefit to that customer? Is the other lender's interest rate a whole lot more lower than their current lender's interest rate? And that's where we, once again, will try and negotiate with the current lender. Customers are still new customers to X bank. We're trying to hold on to them, but they are getting other deals outside. Are you able to match it? If not, then if it's going to be financially beneficial for the customer, we we'll definitely move on. Um, I don't think we ran into the problem in regards to breakage costs during COVID uh, because no one wanted to break their interest rates of that low. And I think we're going to see now, Mark, have you seen too many customers fix, fix their interest rates on this, in this market? Uh, I mean, the most recent one was probably four months ago, five months ago, like 4.4 or 4 point something. That was the one of the promotions that was going out for one, one of the lenders that we were using for a two-year fix, like it was just unheard of at the time as well, yeah. Um, no, besides that, everyone's variable. And, and like you said, like we've got a customer whose fix ends on Friday, the bank's sort of ready to do the refinance and everyone's agreed to the term, but we obviously set the settlement date for the following business day. Um, yeah. Which brings me to my next point. Like when you come to think about all of these things and your fixed rate is about to end, we always tell people, give us a call three months prior because we want to leave enough time for you to send us all the documents for us to go through all the documents and submit the application, get the approval, get the loan documents signed, get both parties on the Texas workspace to settle. And then we can pick the settlement day. And that's the beauty of it. I would rather be ready one month prior 
than one day too late. So definitely contact us three months before your fixed rate ends. You should be able to find that through the account details on your app um, yep. as part of the loan. Um, so that we can set, we can book in the settlement date exactly like when you come to purchase a property and settlement is booked in. We do the same thing. We book in settlement for whenever you want it to be, which financially makes sense to do with the day after the fixed rate because you don't want to rush you off your current very low yeah, fixed rate to go to a higher fixed rate. It makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, but just to, just to clarify, if someone was on a fixed interest rate and they wanted to refinance, they would have to wait. Till that fixed period ended otherwise there would be fees associated they wouldn't have to necessarily wait it depends on what their next move is like if they want to break the home loan to move on to another lender so they can cash out and purchase another property because they're able to service better on another lender then that's beneficial for the customers because they're going to take on another property on so there really isn't any rules it's always going to come down to as brokers we're told is there a financial benefit to the customer for us to move them on to another lender it's always going to come down yeah. to what's better for the customer. So if yeah. you, I think the simple answer is basically there really isn't any rules, but obviously we're not going to be refinancing just for the sake of refinancing. We're going to be refinancing if there's going to be a financial benefit to the customer. For sure. And every time and, uh, you refinance, there's obviously a credit inquiry that goes on your credit report as well. So it's not something you want to do every few months. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing as well. Um, I was also going to say that um, a big misconception with refi. A lot of people that call me and say, "How hey, I want to refinance my property." My first question is, "Why?" Um, and then a lot of them that are fixed say, "I want to pull out equity." I'm like, "Okay, we don't actually need to refinance. You're going to end up getting a break fee. You're going to end up taking your 1.98 to a five point whatever or four point whatever just to cash out. Well, we can just cash out or equity release, whatever you want to call it, with your current lender. We're not breaking the contract. Your loan is staying exactly the same. If we're cashing out." Or releasing, let's say, fifty grand or a hundred grand in equity, it's just going to come up as a new loan um, in your app. We're not breaking your contract. We're not touching your loan. So uh, even if you wanted to sort of set yourself up for the next purchase or cash out to do renovations or to um, trade in the stock market, whatever it is, uh, we definitely don't need to move lenders. It has to make sense. So we obviously spend time with our customers, understanding exactly where they're at at the moment, where they want to be. Um, and we find a way to get them there, minimizing all costs along the way. So if we don't need to refinance, we definitely don't. And and since you mentioned the uh, credit inquiry and whatnot, um, if someone just wants to find out if it's worth it, they can obviously just give you a call and, and you guys can run a scenario and have a look if it is worth it for them to refinance prior to them submitting documents, et cetera. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we've, we've got an aggregator or a system that you know, allows us to do it in a couple of minutes. So we can be on the phone of the customer, a two, three minute phone call. Obviously, we want to be speaking to the customer a lot more, see how they're going, where they've been over the holiday period. But it only take us about two to three minutes to, um, to calculate if there's going to be a financial benefit to them. We just ask them a couple of questions over the phone and ask them for their current you know, repayments. And as Mark said, it, like, it's it's it only benefits the broker to refinance across, um, you know, in, like if you're refinancing for the sake of it, it might not be beneficial for the customer, but it's, been, it's always going to be beneficial for the broker because we're always going to be getting paid from that new lender as well. But it's always going to have to come down to that customer. And I think we're part of compliance and regulation is that we can't move the customers across unless there's a financial benefit to them. That's just the rule. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, definitely with, with interest rates rising, I mean, uh, our advice to everyone would be, you know, pick up the phone, give your broker a call, call Fairly, call Mark, and just find out is there a better option for me? Because you could be saving thousands of dollars across the year easily. And you could be saving with your current lender as well, because unfortunately, I don't think lenders have a team to give the customers a call in regards to, oh, are you on a better rate? Or is there anything that we can do for you? And Mark mentioned before, we, like, if you are on a fixed rate, getting in contact with your broker for three months, the magic that we have here is that our customers actually get an alert and we actually get an alert as well three months prior to our customers' fixed interest rates going uh, breaking. So we get in contact with our customer and our customer is notified three months prior to that fixed rate coming off the, coming off the period. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, the bank's obviously not going to call you either to say, hey, we can give you a better rate because they're not going to be making, you know, it's not in their interest. They want to make as much money off you. So call your brokers because the broker will have access to all the banks and all the lenders and all the options for you. 
and they'll be able to find out if you can save money. Very simply, just call your broker. I was just going to say also, I had a scenario just exactly about this. I had a customer that called me yesterday, not one of my clients, someone new. I didn't sort of write their loans initially. I'm currently with a big lender um, and uh, her fixed rate ends uh, in about two, three weeks or something. And the first thing I told her was, here's the number for the team that has the most power in the bank to reduce your rate. What I want you to do is give them a call directly, um, have a chat with them, see what your rate is going to be after your fixed rate. So a lot of people don't know, but when your fixed rate ends, it doesn't automatically go to a competitive rate. Definitely not. It goes to what we call a revert rate. And her revert rate, this is for an owner-occupied property. It's a comparison rate. Yeah. Yeah. And her her rate was over 7% for the home that she lives in. That's 7.6%, over 7.5%. And so if she did absolutely nothing, if she didn't call me, she didn't call this team, she did absolutely nothing, it was 7.5%. After contacting their number, they reduced it to 5%. That's two and a half percent off with a simple phone call. She was on the phone maybe 10 minutes. So it's literally just a phone call away. And your revert rate starts the day after your fixed rate. So definitely don't wait till you're one week before, two weeks before, and be stressed. I need to do all this in two weeks. Once that's three months before, let us sort it out for you. Um, and you'll be here. You'll be ready a month early, two months early. Have your approval on your loan document signed. And we just told the bank, hey, do it on this date because they finished their fixed rate the day before. In KM, you, you were discussing this week in regards to you know, making the podcast a bit of more of a show, show our, show our you know, true colors. This is one of the things that really frustrates me about our industry is that why are they being put on the highest interest rate possible after they come off a fixed rate or even in some scenarios, variable rates. If the variable rates, you know, after a couple of years, if you haven't done a health check internally or with your broker, it's, it, it gets reverted to a comparison rate. And what that comparison rate is, is basically all fees involved over the 30-year loan term or 25-year loan term of the actual mortgage. Why is that being charged to the customer? Why, why does it need the customer to give them a call and say, hey, I am up for the better interest rate. Can I please have that? Why is it just not given to our customers? And this is what's just I something mean, that frustrates you, me as well. You know the answer. Like, it's a, uh, you, know, you know the answer to the question. The bank's not there to hold you, you know, the bank's not your friend. The bank's there to make money. So if you don't ask, they're going to take your money. They don't care. Um, but they are making so money know, at that 5%. They're, 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 they're not there to hold the, your the, hand, they're to hold your wallet. Yeah. yeah but I, we're heavily regulated, Mark. We're, 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 we're always told, you know, and we do this just naturally, to look after our customer. Where it's part of compliance, making sure that they're on the better interest rate to follow up with their customers. But... I don't know, I mean, because we have had a few customers that call us free, exactly the same scenario that Mark just gave us, and it's just quite frustrating. You know, just like in every industry, so everyone's frustrated, but this is like to be reverted to a 7% on a property that you live in, which is a property, like, in, I guess, in most strategies, you want to try and pay down as soon as possible. Why are they passing on that 7%? Why, why like, do they believe that customers are okay with that 7% or they'll be fine? No, like I think that's something that just definitely needs to be you know, looked at or changed in the future because unfortunately there is customers out there that don't have the capacity sometimes to, you know, be on top of everything. Like everyone's life is busy. Everyone has stuff to do. Everyone, some people might have five or six kids. They don't have time to look at their homeland. They're just making sure their homeland repayments are there. So that's something I've always discussed with BDMs, with you know, different sort of lenders or you know, on uh, CPD days that we go to, why isn't this looked at? Why are we just passing or why are the lenders just passing this sort of rates on customers? And sometimes they're not aware of it, even though a letter's been sent out, an email's been sent out, it might have been their junk mail, whatever it may be. Like, we, they just don't know. And just to give you, I just sort of ran just very quick figures, just to give you an idea of how big of a difference that was for the customer. So the customer, let's just, I'm just putting dummy figures in. Let's say the customer owed 600 grand on that loan. Um, and let's say it went to 7.6%. That was the revert rate. That's what they told her. And they brought it down to 5%. Assuming she had 28 years left on her loan as well. Um, she would say just by that 10 minute phone call, $997 per month, $1,000 per month from a 10 minute phone call. And that's a six, $600,000 loan. Mark, what, what if it's a one mil? Hit it up to one mil. So if we go 7.6% compared to 5%, $1,660 monthly extra. And then the Royal Commission came out asking for brokers to no longer be around because we're not looking after the better interests of our customers. 
But oh, I'll leave that. Yeah. So I can get into the Royal Commission, but we'll just leave that. We'll leave that rant there. All right, that can be for another well, that, day. You know. Uh, that's why we uh, that's why we do what we do, right? So we can uh, educate and uh, empower the uh, the listeners. And if anyone's listening and has a friend that's not listening, you know, subscribe and, and follow and okay. listen and put the power in your in your hands. And and um, yeah, because yeah, as Mark said there, that's in that example. That's you're talking big money there over the course of a year, big big money. That's a couple of holidays and a you know and a gift to to first brick and power learns for being nice people. You know, like it's it's a lot of money there. So. <laughs> Um, I don't have much. I don't have anything else to ask on refinancing. Um, if anything, if you guys have any questions, otherwise we can wrap it up. I was actually going to ask you. We, we've been talking about refinances and the market dropping in Sydney. How's it looking for twenty twenty three in general across all of Australia, interstate and in Sydney, in regards to property purchases? What changes are you seeing? Are you seeing a change in customers where they're a little freaked out in regards to inflation? They don't know if they should be spending money now or holding on to their money. What are we seeing out there? Because at the moment, Mark and I see along, like we're still seeing a lot of uh, purchases coming through, but, but we're seeing a lot more refinances coming through. How's that look yeah, from I the think, property side of you? I think definitely the priority for a lot of people is refinancing for sure uh, as a step one to, to get the best rate. Um, however, in saying that, as, as a business ourselves, we are the, this is the busiest we've ever been. Um, in the history of our, our business, which doesn't make sense in some people's eyes. Um, but we see it as a lot of these, a lot of our clients are people who follow and listen to our podcasts and follow our pages and whatnot, but, and, and they're quite educated and they understand that, you know, there's always opportunity and these are actually the best times to purchase. What we're seeing and what we, I think we're going to see across the year is, you know, as long as interest rates continue to rise, obviously borrowing powers decrease. Now, when interest rates rise, as Mark was saying in his example, you know, a million dollars, the difference is huge um, on that on that two and a half percent, you know, saving. So the higher the loan amount, obviously, the more expensive that um, that loan becomes and considerably more expensive. So the very, very expensive areas, we'll just talk Sydney for a second. You know, your your elite areas, your Point Piper, Vaucluse, these kind of areas, they get hit the hardest because the demand pool for those areas is already very small. You know, you only have a handful of people buying a five to $10 million property plus. Um, and then you, you go into the, low, the level below, uh, which is, you, you know, your two and a half to $5 million properties, which again, you, you might have two handfuls of people that can kind of purchase these properties. So they get hit the hardest because the demand pool is, the, is, is quite small. You then go into these areas, anything kind of in that 800, to, you know, so people who are borrowing 1.2 to 1.5, their borrowing powers have probably dropped, right? And, um, you know, it might drop them into that 1 million, 1.1, just under 1 million range. So you find that the areas that are sub a million or sub 1.1 becomes extremely competitive for anyone that wants to buy still. And you find that these areas tend to not fluctuate hugely. Um, you don't have, you know, you might not get growth but you might not get massive losses as well. You might have a net minus 0.1%, minus 0.2% over the course of the year. Um, but when, you know, CoreLogic or the news or whoever reports this data at the end of the year, for example, at the end of 22, like Mark said, minus 10, 11% for Sydney, that's Sydney as a whole. But that Sydney as a whole obviously includes Point Piper, Vaucluse, uh, Bondi, and also includes Campbelltown, Roos, Raby, um, you know, so these are very, very different markets within Sydney. So when you look at it as a whole, you might have Campbelltown up 0.5% or minus 0.1%, for example, and then Point Piper minus 4%. And then so the average becomes extreme because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to look at Sydney as a whole like that because the areas are so different. So I think what we'll find is the areas that are competitive are the areas where they're more affordable areas. So the more affordable areas, you're going to find a lot of buyers. So we're still buying in Adelaide um, and we're still getting knocked out of the market. And there was an open home last week in Adelaide that we looked at and there was over 100 people at the open home, um, which is unbelievable. But the purchase price for this property was $450,000. So people who are already at that price point, even people who are at six, 700 and their budgets have dropped, have now come into that price point as well. So you have so many more people in a smaller segment of a, a smaller price segment. So your demand pool is heavily increased 
in an area where there's very limited supply. So I think what we're going to see is certain areas going to are going to drop, and then certain areas are going to you know do quite well. Um, if at the very least not drop, and we all know what happens as soon as interest rates drop, we all get an influx of phone calls. I want to buy. I want to buy. I want to buy. And then obviously now you have an extreme amount of buyers happening coming in at one point. Um, they want to invest or they want to buy their own home. And then again, the supply is limited. So that's where we see these really crazy runs. And history repeats itself. I mean, it's happened you know four or five times over the last thirty years. Every time there's some sort of economic issue, whether it was the GFC, COVID, whatever it is. Um, so I expect that to happen again because you know this is not new. It happens over and over again, and we just got to watch trends. So as a buyer. Or in our business, what we say and nothing changes, you know, you guys will know what I'm going to say here. If you've got the capacity to purchase an investment property, um, now is the time to do so. If you don't have the capacity and you're not financially in a position to do so, then, you know, this is the time where you're saving money so you can get ready to purchase. But whoever is buying now, once those interest rates drop slightly and inflation drops slightly and then there's better sentiment in the market, these these people are going to make the biggest gains because they've already got that supply yeah Yeah, they control that lack of supply that already exists so what we do in our business obviously we do a nationwide data analysis for every client personalized to their strategy and their situation and their finances and their budget and we're trying to locate the exact pinpoint you know top five or ten suburbs in all of australia for that person so we're not buying in sydney we're not buying in adelaide we're not buying we're buying in a very specific suburb in adelaide or a very specific suburb in Sydney for that person's criteria. Um, so I think that's that's kind of my thoughts on what will happen this year. We'll see if it plays out that way. But based off history, that's exactly what's going to happen. It's If you've got the ability to buy, now is the time to buy. And in those very, very competitive markets, um, you know, for example, that property in Adelaide that we were looking at, it's not only Adelaide in Adelaide owners and investors, it's people interstate because their budgets have dropped. So they're looking, where can I where can I spend my money? Um, and it's, you know, if you had 700 grand in Sydney, which barely gets you a property and it's dropped to 500, well, you're not buying in Sydney anymore. So they're looking at external markets. So there's a lot more demand into a, a very specific area with very limited supply. One question I've got. We've been seeing a lot of customers that come through, either through to you or through to us. And we, in the last couple of years, we saw a shift where you know, a lot of customers are always like, we want to invest in Sydney. There's more capital gain in Sydney. I think the rent was a little bit more better back then as well. Do you see customers coming back into the Sydney market in regards to investments? Or have we seen a change overall in regards to customers going for the higher rental yield interstate? You know, what you just mentioned there, purchasing for 490 grand or 480 grand interstate. Are we going to see customers coming back into Sydney? Because I can't actually remember. Maybe we've had one or two customers in the last couple of months that invested in Sydney. But overall, it's been a lot of interstate. Yeah, it's a funny question. I mean, I was speaking to a client um, of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago that we purchased for him you know, 18 months ago in Sydney. And he's done well. He's done well. He's made, made some money. Um, but when we had that conversation, uh, initially, you know, the data indicated it was better for him to purchase interstate. And, but he was pretty adamant on Sydney. So we, we purchased in Sydney and he still made some good money. Um, but he was... That conversation two weeks ago was he just said to me out of the blue oh cam i wish i i wish i just bought interstate instead of sydney and i think that's really more of a cash flow response because obviously as interest rates go up the rent and mind you they're getting decent rent for for what for sydney but as interest rates go up cash flow becomes a strain this person is getting married paying for the wedding so their expenses their life is changing but that property the yield has you know effectively decreased because of interest rates changing as well. Um, I think the obsession with Sydney is only from people from Sydney. You know, it's because when I speak to people from outside of Sydney, when we have our clients that come from Brizzy, Melbourne, Adelaide, or not so much Melbourne, but Brisbane, Adelaide, um, Perth, wherever it is, aside from Sydney and Melbourne, Sydney is not even a consideration. They just don't think about it. They just you know the question they ask me is where can I get the best return? Whereas when I speak to people from Sydney and Melbourne, it's more so, well, doesn't Sydney give me the best return? Like there's a, there's a presumption and um, presumption or assumption. I don't know the right word. As there is an assumption that Sydney is the best. 
And that's usually because that's just where they've lived and that's what they know or what they think they know. Um, and when you average out the last 30 years, the growth rates from a percentage are almost identical across different states. Over the last 12 months, uh, 18 months, Adelaide has been the top performing um, state. Before that, it was Brisbane. Before that, it was Hobart. So it's been a long time since Sydney was the top performing state uh, city. So yes, I think people are still going to invest in Sydney, especially if they're from Sydney. Um, but I think there is definitely more uh, conversations occurring regarding cash flow as a consideration, especially if you want to build a portfolio or eventually buy your own home or whatever it is. Um, and that I think that's testament to you guys as brokers as well, having that conversation with them saying, and I think this is the difference between a regular mortgage broker and, you know, the top brokers like yourselves, where it's a regular broker is just looking at this property. What can I, how can I get you whatever money you want for this property? Whereas you guys are looking at, okay, how can I help you get this one? And then the next one and the one after and the one after. And real estate is a game of finance. Uh, you know, you have to be able to finance property to be able to buy more property. So if you want to build a portfolio, we need to make sure that you can buy this one and then buy again. And it's not just an equity thing. It's an equity and a, it's a capital growth. It's a, it's a deposit. It's a deposit and serviceability. A lot of people forget about the serviceability part of it. They just think I've got a million bucks in equity. Great. But your, your property is negative 12% a year. Like you can't afford, you can't afford to buy an apple, let alone a property. Right. So there's, I think, yeah, I think credit to you guys as brokers and, to the, the top brokers out there who are actually looking at it as a portfolio and not just one property purchase um, because those, you guys help these people educate them and they in turn end up with an actual portfolio as opposed to just one property. It's funny, it's funny that you say the whole, um, well, I've got equity in my property. Why can't get a, why can't get a loan? That's, that's one of the questions that we get regularly. Yeah. The other one is, um, just because we're speaking out loud. Um, the other one is, <laughs> yeah, I run, a, I run a business that makes 400 grand cash a year, but on tax, I've lost 40 grand. How come I can't get a loan? Well, <laughs> double is short. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we'll cut it off there before we get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Actually, just about that, I was just going to say as well, um, just about refinancing and also about valuations and the value of properties going down and stuff. If your value of your property has gone down, um, where your loan compared to the current value of the property has exceeded 80%, vast majority of all lenders will actually charge you LMI, lenders mortgage insurance, to refinance. That'll be another thing we'd look at before we refinance because, uh, again, that wouldn't make financial sense. There are some lenders that go up to 85%. If there's an LMI waiver, if you're an accountant, a lawyer, a medico, we can go up to 90% uh, with some lenders. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I was going to say as well, um, if you bought at your maximum borrowing capacity two years ago when the rates were 1.98 fixed and the banks were only adding 2.5% on that when they were assessing files as opposed to today where the rates are mid fours to mid fives and the banks are adding 3% on top, if your income hasn't changed and your, for example, interest only and the debt is the same, very likely you probably won't be able to service the refinance. We do obviously, and that's where we come in. We obviously have. 40 plus lenders that we can go on. We have their calculator, so we can chuck it on 40 plus lenders to check um, if it actually works. But um, just another quick thing to speak about. Them. And that's why it was so important during that time, having that conversation with the customers with what's your strategy in your next, one of the main questions, so I'll stop there. One of the main questions we need to be asking, I'm, I'm sure came, this is definitely something that you'll be asking as well. What does your next five to 10 years look like? Not now, not next year or the year after, what do you want to be looking to do in the next five, 10 years? If it's a single applicant coming through, are you looking to get married in the next couple of years? Are you looking to start a family in the next couple of years? Are you looking to move interstate, find another job? These are the sort of questions that must be asked because when we're in the moment, we're excited. We've all gone through that. We're in the moment. Yeah, I want to get this. I want to get that, whatever it may be. But I think what you know we try to do is we want to know what you the rest of your life is looking like. And we, we want to make sure we put you in the position where you can actually get to those goals, your goals. So I think that's one of the main questions. I'm, I mean, I'm guessing people that come to you, obviously everyone's like, I want one property a year. I want two properties a year. Okay, how are we going to get there? Let's have a sit down and discussion and how are we going to get there? 
And if the customer's like, no, yeah. I want to buy investment properties in Sydney, but I want 10 in the next 10 years, is that possible? Or are we just going to be maxing, ma maximizing ourselves out on one property in Sydney? So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the first thing we do with a client is what, why, well, we ask them why we're buying property because there's obviously a reason you're investing. Is it to, to build a passive income? Is it to help you buy your dream home? Wh whatever it is, we need to know what your goal is so we can work backwards. Because if we don't have a goal, we don't know what we're work working towards. What are we supposed to buy? How do we, how do we individualize the strategy to you? We can go buy you whatever. It might not be the right product for you. And, you know, just, just today we had a conversation with someone who was really keen to buy an investment property, was about to sign up with us. Um, but then told me, you know what, we're actually thinking of buying a home next year. I said, well, put the brakes. If that's what you want to do, this purchase is going to actually inhibit you from doing that next year as opposed to benefit you. But if we're looking at buying that home in four years, five years, whatever, then yeah, the investment property makes sense. Um, but yeah, we have to know because otherwise it can actually make it worse for you if you know if you go the wrong the wrong down the wrong route but um definitely yeah so i i think the takeaway is definitely you know have a conversation with your broker about refinancing um because there's so much money to be saved um especially in the current climate with interest rates rising and whatnot speak to the brokers because these guys have that panel of like mark said 40 lenders and they'll find the best option for you and they will be honest with you and tell you if it makes sense to do so or not. And they're not just going to do it if it doesn't make sense. And the other thing is, yeah, if, if you're in a position to invest, definitely this is a good time to invest for sure. Yeah. Um, nothing else to add? Cool. Uh, so we thought this was going to be a 20 minute episode. I think it's going to be longer, but better for the listeners, I guess. Uh, thank you as always, gentlemen, and we'll see you next week. It's quick. Huh? Yeah.